Governor King, distinguished guests, students, members of the press, and friends of LSE, my name is Craig Calhoun, and it is an honor to be here today as the new director of the school to welcome you all to the LSE campus and to introduce this evening's lecture. This evening's lecture is in memory of Josiah Charles Stamp, who obtained a degree in economics from LSE in 1916. During his career, he was appointed as the director of the Bank of England, and he also served as a governor and vice chairman of LSE. Stamp died in 1941, and the next year a trust was set up jointly by the Bank of England, the London Midland and Scottish Railway, ICI, and the Abbey Road Building Society to pay for the organization of a Stamp Memorial Lecture all of these firms and organizations, Stamp had served in some capacity during his lifetime. Recent Stamp Memorial speakers include Jean-Claude Trichet, Ben Bernanke, and George Akerlof, whom we were just discussing. It is with great pleasure that we welcome Governor King back to the LSE this evening. Mervyn King is the governor of the Bank of England and is chairman of the Monetary Policy Committee and Financial Policy Committee. Mervyn King studied at King's College, Cambridge, and at Harvard. He taught at Cambridge and Birmingham universities before coming to the LSE in 1984 as a professor of economics. During his time at the LSE, in fact, he founded the Financial Markets Group. The governor was made an honorary fellow of the school in 2002. Before I invite the governor to start his lecture, I will remind those of you who are on Twitter that the hashtag for today's event is LSE Stamp. As usual, after the lecture, there will be a chance for you, especially the LSE students among you, to put your questions to the governor. But now, will you please join me in welcoming Mervyn King back to the LSE to deliver his lecture entitled 20 Years of Inflation Targeting. Mervyn. Director, thank you, and could I add my own personal welcome to you to London and wish you every success in your role as director here. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'm delighted to be back at the LSE to deliver the Stamp Memorial Lecture. As you've just heard, Lord Stamp was eminent in the worlds of both academia and public life, and an alumnus and governor of the school and a director of the Bank of England. Following his untimely death in an air raid in 1941, he was succeeded at the bank by John Maynard Keynes. And Keynes and Stamp used to broadcast together on the BBC. Their conversations during the 1930s at the height of the Great Depression are eerily reminiscent of the enormous challenges we face today, as you can see from the following exchange in 1930. Keynes, is not the mere existence of general unemployment for any length of time an absurdity, a confession of failure, and a hopeless and inexcusable breakdown of the economic machine? Stamp, your language is rather violent. You wouldn't expect to put an earthquake tidy in a few minutes, would you? I object to the view that it's a confession of failure if you cannot put a complicated machine right all at once. Keynes, in my opinion, the return to the gold standard, the way we did it, set our currency system an almost impossible task. If prices outside this country have been going up since 1925, that would have done something to balance the effect on this country of the return to the gold standard. Stamp, hush, Maynard, I cannot bear it. Remember, I am a director of the Bank of England. <laughs> In some respects, our experience today is no different. Putting right our economic machine is proving a slow and difficult task. But in the 1920s and 30s, the government made the task substantially harder by reinstating the gold standard at a rate that left sterling overvalued. Today, monetary policy is part of the solution, not part of the problem. And that is thanks in large part to the monetary framework we have had in place since 1992. 
20 years ago today, on the 9th of October 1992, the newspapers reported that for the first time, monetary policy in Britain would be based on an explicit target for inflation. Three weeks earlier, sterling had been forced out of the European exchange rate mechanism, the ERM. A new framework for monetary policy was needed. And after keen debates within the Treasury and the Bank of England, the answer emerged, the inflation target. The essence of this new approach was the combination of a numerical target for inflation in the medium term and the flexibility to respond to shocks to the economy in the short run. And so the framework became known as flexible inflation targeting. Well, it's time to reflect on 20 years' experience of inflation targeting, 15 years of stability, and five years of turbulence, the Great Stability and the Great Recession. You can see that in Table 1 and Charts 1 to 3 in the handout. Over that period, monetary policy around the world has changed radically. Inflation targeting has spread to more than 30 countries, and the results in terms of low and stable inflation have been impressive. There have been pronounced reductions in the mean and in the variance and in the persistence of inflation in Britain and elsewhere. During the past 20 years, annual consumer price inflation in this country has averaged 2.1%, remarkably close to our 2% target, and well below the averages of over 12% a year in the, year in the 1970s and nearly 6% a year in the 1980s. But did we pay too high a price for this achievement in lowering inflation? After 15 years of apparent success, the past five years of financial crisis and turmoil in the world economy have raised serious questions about the adequacy of inflation targeting. We don't have to look far to see that the costs of financial instability are huge. In Britain, total output is today some 15% below an extrapolation of its pre-crisis trend, and that gap is likely to persist for some time. In the light of such costs, should monetary policy go beyond targeting price stability, and also target financial stability? And should the present financial crisis lead us to question the intellectual basis of monetary policy as practiced in most of the industrialized world today? Those questions are the subject of my lecture. But let's start at the beginning. Shortly after the adoption of inflation targeting, my predecessor but one, Lord Kingsdown, Robin Lee Pemberton, as he then was, gave an important speech at the LSE, indeed in this very room, entitled The Case for Price Stability. I remember it vividly because I had been involved in helping to draft it. It was an exciting time. We were reconstructing British monetary policy after the trauma of forced exit from the ERM. In those days, of course, the Chancellor set monetary policy and the Bank of England played only a behind-the-scenes role. But the role of the bank was about to change. First, with the inflation report in February 1993, which gave the bank its own public voice, and then with independence for the bank and the creation of the Monetary Policy Committee, the MPC, in 1997. The initial reception of the inflation target amongst economists and commentators alike was distinctly mixed. As the Financial Times put it in a leader published 20 years ago today, the Chancellor's speech was as economically thin as it was politically disappointing. The critics argued that the new framework was inadequate to control inflation. They were to be proved wrong. Over the previous 20 years, inflation had been the single biggest problem facing the UK economy, peaking at 27% a year in 1975. Over the subsequent 20 years, inflation, as I mentioned just now, would average only 
And the credibility of inflation targeting has meant that since 2007, the United Kingdom has been able to absorb the largest depreciation of sterling since the Second World War, as well as very large rises in oil and commodity prices, with an increase in inflation to an average of only 3.2% over the past five years, and without dislodging long-term inflation expectations. So the framework has been tested and has proved its worth. But the current crisis has demonstrated vividly that price stability is not sufficient for economic stability more generally. Low and stable inflation didn't prevent a banking crisis. Would it have been better to accept sustained periods of below or above target inflation in order to prevent the build-up of imbalances in the financial system? In other words, is there sometimes a trade-off between price stability and financial stability? The experience of the past five years suggests that we reassess the intellectual framework underpinning monetary policy. The emergence of inflation targeting and the successful results in the form of the great stability coincided with the development of the so-called New Keynesian consensus on macroeconomic theory. This framework offered a theoretical foundation for flexible inflation targeting. Central to the New Keynesian view is the assumption that some prices are sticky and adjust slowly. That has two implications. First, high inflation produces inefficient changes in relative prices. As a result, there's a cost to inflation. Second, when central banks change nominal interest rates, they also affect real interest rates, and so encourage households and businesses to switch expenditure from today to tomorrow, or, as in present circumstances, the other way around. In this way, central banks can, in the model at least, offset shocks to aggregate demand. But there are shocks to supply as well as demand. External cost shocks sometimes drive inflation away from target, as we saw in recent years with rises in world energy and food prices. Because other prices are sticky, attempts to keep inflation at target all the time would result in inefficient fluctuations in output. There is therefore a trade-off between stabilizing inflation and stabilizing output. Following a cost shock, it's sensible to bring inflation back to the target gradually. In this by now conventional framework, the central bank is effectively choosing a trade-off between the volatility of inflation and the volatility of output. This is sometimes described as choosing a point on the Taylor frontier, shown as in chart four on your handout, this frontier shows the combinations of lowest volatility of inflation for a given volatility of output. And the optimal choice, choosing a point on that frontier, implies a policy reaction function describing how the central bank responds to shocks as they hit the economy. But inevitably, as with all models, the basic New Keynesian model omits a number of key factors. The treatment of expectations is simplified and neglects the possibility that expectations themselves may be a source of fluctuations, rather than simply reflecting changes elsewhere in the economy. Sentiment can vary, misperceptions occur, and people can change the heuristics they use to cope with a complex world. And it lacks an account of financial intermediation, so money, credit, and banking play no meaningful role. Well, those omissions obviously limit the ability of the model to help us understand the trade-offs between monetary policy and financial stability. Well, there is by now an extensive literature on financial frictions, including attempts to incorporate them in New Keynesian models. But it turns out that such extensions make little difference to how shocks are propagated or to the optimal policy or to the quantitative conclusion that overwhelmingly the most important objective remains inflation stabilization. Existing models then don't tell us why stability today may come at the expense of instability tomorrow. 
Perhaps we should heed the advice of Ricardo Caballero, who has written that macroeconomic research has been in fine-tuning mode within the local maximum of the dynamic stochastic general equilibrium world when we should be in broad exploration mode. Well, let me now move into broad exploration mode and give three examples in which a trade-off between monetary and financial stability could arise and which could, in theory, justify a policy of aiming off the inflation target in order to reduce the risk of fin future financial instability. And I'll do that before I turn to whether such a policy would have been appropriate before the crisis. The first example is where misperceptions about future incomes persist and are embodied in key prices in the economy, such as the exchange rate and long-term interest rates. Households, businesses and banks can all make big mistakes when forming judgments about the future and make spending decisions today which they will come to regret when their true lifetime budget constraints are revealed. There is no mechanism for ensuring that misperceptions about the sustainable level of spending are corrected quickly. It may take many years before those beliefs are invalidated by experience. So an equilibrium pattern of spending and saving can emerge that is stable temporarily but not sustainable indefinitely. And misaligned prices may reinforce mistaken beliefs if people are using market prices to extract signals about future incomes and consumption opportunities. Evidence of the persistence of misperceptions can, I believe, be seen in the imbalances in the world and especially the European economies. I don't mean to imply that when economic agents make these mistakes, they are behaving irrationally. Rather, that in a world of intrinsic uncertainty, it's far from obvious how to make decisions. In a highly uncertain and complex world, households are on their, learn, on their own and learning from experience. When it comes to decisions about how much to spend and how much to save, expectations of future incomes are crucial. In the absence of a complete set of markets for consumption goods and labor, there is no mechanism to ensure that decisions today and so the implied plans for tomorrow will be consistent with the possibilities available in the future. If revisions to expectations of future incomes are uncorrelated across households, then aggregate spending will be relatively stable. The problem comes when many households have, over have similarly over-optimistic views about the future. Aggregate spending and borrowing can then be unsustainably high and lead to an inevitable correction at an unpredictable date when reality dawns. Financial markets both reflect and propagate that common degree of optimism. Sentiment and animal spirits can change quickly. Examples include the extrapolation of past growth rates of incomes or asset prices into the future when in fact they reflect an adjustment of the level of income or asset price to a new equilibrium. At the time, the MPC argued that the rise in the ratio of house prices to incomes in the years leading up to 2007 reflected a fall in long-term real interest rates. In other words, an adjustment to a new level equilibrium house price to income ratio. But if households extrapolated past increases in house prices into the future, then they may have mistakenly inferred that future incomes too would be higher and so spent and borrowed more than could be sustained. Similar arguments could be made about the reaction of businesses and households to the rise in the sterling effective exchange rate in the late 1990s, and I shall return to this later. Since long-term interest rates in financial markets are, if anything, even lower today, the question of sustainability hasn't yet been resolved. Misperceptions mean that unsustainable levels of spending and associated levels of debt can build up over many years. When those misperceptions are eventually corrected, 
They lead to sudden large changes in asset values, a synchronized deleveraging of balance sheets, a large downward correction to spending and output, and defaults. Keynesian policies to smooth the path of adjustment by supporting aggregate demand can help in the short run, but their effectiveness is limited by the fact that a significant adjustment to spending from consumption to investment is required. If policymakers can first identify misperceptions and second correct them by changes in monetary policy, both highly uncertain empirically, then there is indeed a trade-off between hitting the inflation target and reducing the chance of a financial crisis down the road. But are central banks less prone to misperceptions than others? My second example concerns what Mizaki Shirakawa, governor of the Bank of Japan, calls the cycle of confidence. He argues that success breeds confidence and eventually overconfidence and complacency leading to collapse. Such ideas are closely associated with the work of Hyman Minsky and others. Minsky set out a financial instability hypothesis in which a period of stability encourages exuberance in credit markets and subsequent instability. Perhaps the experience of unprecedented stability in the UK and world economies before the crisis dulled the senses and bred complacency about future risks. I talked about this when I christened the period leading up to 2003 the nice decade, the non-inflationary, consistently expansionary decade. The point of that speech was that the following decade was unlikely to be as nice. And of course, it wasn't. But the point didn't get home. And the financial system became more and more fragile as the leverage of our banking system rose to unprecedented levels. The experience of continuing stability may have sowed the seeds of its own destruction. That idea has been explored recently in an interesting new book by Nassim Taleb. He argues that the opposite of fragility is not resilience or robustness, but anti-fragility. That is a state in which people or institutions thrive on volatility, shocks to the system and risk. We go to the gym to stress our muscles in order to strengthen them. Occasional seismic activity may prevent a more damaging earthquake. Frequent exposure to shocks and surprises may improve the way people learn about and manage risks. Unless we train and practice at coping with bad outcomes, we may fail to respond in the right way to large adverse shocks when they do come. Anti-fragility doesn't imply that it might be desirable to engineer small recessions in order to head off a deep depression. We know far too little about the economy to attempt any such strategy. But it offers a warning of the dangers of believing that monetary policy can and should offset all shocks. Rather than pretend that we can forecast the future, a more intelligent response is to reinforce the resilience of those parts of the financial system that we cannot permit to fail and encourage entry and exit in a free market in other parts. My third example relates to the so-called risk-taking channel of monetary policy. Short-term policy rates, especially when they are as now exceptionally low, may encourage investors to take on more risk than they would otherwise wish as they search for yield. Financial institutions with long-term commitments, such as pension funds and insurance companies, need to match the yield they promised on their liabilities with the yield on their assets. When interest rates are high, they can invest in safe assets to generate the necessary returns. When interest rates are low, however, they are forced to invest in riskier assets to continue to meet their target nominal rate of return. That tends to push down risk premium and lower the price of borrowing. And other investors too find it difficult to accept that in a world of low nominal and real interest rates, 
equilibrium rates of return will not meet their previous expectations. If these mechanisms are important, the financial cycle may be heavily influenced by monetary policy, especially when interest rates are low, also creating the possibility of a trade-off between monetary and financial stability. All three examples suggest that the conventional analysis of the trade-off between the volatility of inflation and the volatility of output is likely to be far too optimistic. Does this add up to a case for leaning against the wind of rising asset prices rather than waiting to mop up after the bust? Certainly, we've seen that monetary policy cannot fully offset the effects of financial crises for two reasons. First, crises may impact output before the response of monetary policy is felt. And second, crises typically reduce potential supply growth, for example, by disrupting the supply of credit to productive firms. A failure to take financial instability into account creates an unduly optimistic view of where the Taylor frontier lies, especially when it's based on data drawn from a period of stability. Relative to a Taylor frontier that reflects just aggregate demand and cost shocks, the addition of financial instability shocks generates what I call, in chart five, the Minsky-Taylor frontier. This Minsky-Taylor frontier reflects the influence of misperceptions, financial cycles, and the search for yield. On the Minsky-Taylor curve, for a given degree of inflation variability, output is more volatile in the long run than on the simple Taylor curve. Ignoring financial instability might mean choosing a policy reaction function that is believed to imply a trade-off at point O in chart five. In fact, the true trade-off is given by point P. And once that is understood, then the optimal policy reaction function might well change and correspond to a trade-off at point Q. <clears throat> the examples I've given suggest, therefore, the possibility that there is a trade-off between meeting the inflation target in the short run and reducing the risk of a financial crisis in the long run. So to shed light on whether that possibility warrants a change to the way we implement inflation targeting, I want now to conduct a counterfactual thought experiment and ask whether, with the benefit of hindsight, should interest rates, ask with the benefit of hindsight, whether monetary policy before 2007 should have been set differently. Should interest rates have been higher during that period in order to mitigate some of the growth of credit, rise in asset prices, and increases in the leverage of the banking system? Many commentators today seem to think that the answer is clearly yes though I seem to remember that fewer said so at the time. And most of the pressure on the MPC from without and within was for lower rather than higher levels of bank rate. Now, before trying to answer the question, let me remind you of two key facts about the great stability. First, the growth rate of GDP over the period prior to the onset of the crisis in 2007 was 2.9%, very close to its previous long-run average of 2.8%. You can see that in Table 2. And second, the policy rate set by the MPC was actually higher than that in any other G7 country for almost the whole of the 10 years prior to the crisis. And that you can see in Chart 6. But if the rate of growth was sustainable, its pattern was not. In the late 1990s, there had been a substantial rise in sterling of around 25% against most other currencies, leading to the emergence of imbalances in the UK economy. These took the form of a shift in the composition of output away from manufacturing and towards services, and a shift in demand away from exports towards domestic demand national saving fell to unsustainably low levels. In the early years of the MPC, there was an intense debate about these imbalances and how they should affect monetary policy. 
The question was how much to stimulate domestic demand at the cost of exacerbating the imbalances in order to compensate for weak external demand. And the minutes of the MPC in 2001 and 2002 explicitly discussed the case for accepting inflation below target over the two-year horizon. The committee rejected the case, and during that period, most of the dissenting votes on the MPC were for lower rates. You can see that in Table 3. The dilemma and the MPC's resolution of it was summed up by my predecessor, Eddie George, in 2002 when he said, so in effect, we have taken the view that unbalanced growth in our present situation is better than no growth. Or as some commentators have put it, a two-speed economy is better than a no-speed economy. Was that the right choice? As in some other industrialized countries, asset prices, including house prices, had been pushed up by falls in long-term real interest rates. Those falls are shown in chart 7. But since those long rates were set in world capital markets by the interaction between the demand for investment and the very large supply of saving, only a strategy of persistently higher interest rates at home than overseas, which to some extent we did follow, would have prevented a significant rise in asset prices, thus reducing some of the upward pressure on credit growth. Such a strategy might have brought some benefit for financial stability. It's possible that without rising asset prices, we might have kept expectations of future incomes on a more modest path that did not later require a correction. Higher rates and I think the resulting recession and unemployment might have reminded firms, households and financial markets that the economy was not guaranteed to experience continual steady growth and thereby have disrupted the dynamic I described earlier in which stability leads to overconfidence and eventual instability by stressing the economy in order to promote its anti-fragility in Taleb's phrase. And higher domestic interest rates might have alleviated some of the search for yield that probably followed a period of low rates. But this financial crisis was global. The United Kingdom could not alone have stopped it happening we would still have suffered greatly from the very sudden and sharp fall in world output and trade in 2008-9. We might still have experienced a banking crisis and a domestic credit crunch because, as my colleague Ben Broadbent has described, lending to the UK real economy contributed only a small share of the rise in the leverage of the largest UK banks, which reflected much more an expansion of lending within the financial sector and overseas. That you can see in Table 4. Three quarters of UK banks' losses to date have been on foreign assets. The search for yield that prompted excessive risk-taking was the result of low long-term interest rates around the world, not simply rates in the United Kingdom. So what would have happened had we adopted the counterfactual policy of higher levels of bank rate. Of course, it's impossible to know with certainty. And much depends on what would have happened to the exchange rate. On the MPC, two views were discussed. One was that by setting interest rates at a much higher level, so dampening domestic demand and output growth, expectations of the long-run exchange rate consistent with a sustainable path of domestic demand might be dislodged and jolted down to a lower equilibrium level from point A to point B in chart 8. Certainly there seemed good reason at the time to imagine that slower growth at home might mean that hot money would return to countries experiencing stronger growth. As a result, the current exchange rate would have fallen from point O to point P in chart 8 and then been expected to follow the path PB consistent with uncovered interest parity. The result would have been higher external demand to offset weaker domestic demand, and after a time we might have attained one-speed growth, so avoiding the unpalatable choice between two-speed and no-speed growth. 
The other view was that higher interest rates would not have altered the expected long-run equilibrium value of sterling, but would simply have led to an immediate upwards jump in the exchange rate, as the greater interest rate differential with other countries would have shifted up the uncovered interest rate parity path from OA to QA in chart 8. That would have meant even weaker external demand and a more depressed domestic economy. Higher interest rates would have moderated domestic credit growth and asset prices, but only at the expense of slower output growth, rising unemployment, and a prolonged undershoot of the inflation target. Everything would have hinged on the success of the strategy of higher rates in bringing down the expected equilibrium level of sterling in the long run to avoid a further damaging rise in sterling in the short run and a recession. At best, persistently higher interest rates would have implied an initial slowing of growth, a deliberate attempt to weaken sterling, and an undershooting of the inflation target for a period. And at worst, we would have seen the exchange rate appreciate further. The decade would have been characterized by rising unemployment and very low inflation. To have deviated from our statutory remit in a direction that would have imposed real costs to output and employment would have been a big gamble. But the costs of the ensuing crisis have been so great that we can't stop there and say that nothing could have been done. <clears throat> Was there a better alternative to a strategy of higher interest rates? Well, the natural first line of defense against financial crises is macroprudential policy. In principle, such policies can shift the Minsky-Taylor curve closer to the original Taylor curve. With hindsight, before 2007, there should have been a cap on the leverage of banks. And you can see the rise of leverage of banks in chart 9. And that cap should have been tightened as asset prices increased and the likely exposure to losses also increased. That, in fact, is why we do now have a macroprudential policy regime in the United Kingdom. It will be overseen by the Bank of England's Financial Policy Committee, which will have the power to direct and make recommendations to regulators about capital and leverage in the UK banking system. In my judgment, the big challenge to monetary policy before the crisis was a serious mispricing in long-term interest and exchange rates and the imbalances that resulted. Much of this was outside the control of UK policymakers and reflected developments in the world economy. It is arguable, though not certain, that in the absence of a macroprudential regime or tighter fiscal policy, persistently higher interest rates might have been a second best strategy. It would, though, have been a big gamble. So it's vital that macroprudential tools and microprudential regulation become part of the armory of a central bank to mitigate, if not prevent, the build-up of excessive leverage and risk-taking in the banking and wider financial sector. From next year, the Bank of England will have those responsibilities and the new Financial Policy Committee is already up and running. But macroprudential tools deal with symptoms rather than the underlying problems of misperceptions and mispricing. Although we think the new tools given to the bank would have helped to alleviate the last crisis, it would be optimistic to rely solely on such tools to prevent all future crises it would be sensible to recognize that there may be circumstances in which it is justified to aim off the inflation target for a while in order to moderate the risk of financial crises. Monetary policy cannot just mop up after a crisis. Risks must be dealt with beforehand. I do not see this as inconsistent with inflation targeting because it is the stability of inflation over long periods not year-to-year -year changes, which is crucial to economic success. The key principles underlying flexible inflation targeting are credibility, predictability, and transparency of decision-taking, and they will remain the cornerstone 
of successful monetary policy in the future. Governor Lee Pemberton's 1992 lecture concluded with a message for the LSE. In a world of price stability, you might not think of inviting the Governor of the Bank of England to address you. Had price stability guaranteed financial stability, and had I achieved my long-held ambition of being boring, that might have been true. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's not how things have worked out. What I've tried to show tonight is that the case for price stability is as strong today as it was 20 years ago, both in theory and in practice. The clarity and simplicity of the inflation target helps to anchor inflation expectations on the target. We forget the lessons of the 1970s and 1980s at our peril. In the end, the essence of central banking is to maintain confidence in and the value of paper money. It is far too soon to bury inflation targeting. Together with central bank independence, it played a key role in bringing price stability to this country. As the Times reported 20 years ago, the pound's firmer tone and softer German money market rates could tempt the Chancellor to shave half a point off base rates to coincide with the Prime Minister's speech at Brighton today. Well, the party conference season is no longer a time for speculation about changes in interest rates. No doubt we shall learn a great deal about the appropriate allocation of responsibilities to monetary policy on the one hand and macroprudential policy on the other over the next 20 years. But we should not throw out the baby with the bathwater. Low and stable inflation is a prerequisite for economic success. Much of what I've said is, I hope, a call to arms for economists and especially younger economists to rethink the foundations of our macroeconomic theories. Not to abandon rigorous modelling. After all, in the words of last year's Nobel Prize winner Tom Sargent, it takes a model to beat a model. But to recognise that in our present models, the way we think of human behaviour in the face of irreducible uncertainty is seriously incomplete. Ideas matter far more than is usually recognized in the public discussion of monetary policy, which concentrates too much on personalities. Keynes and Stamp both knew that. In February 1929, Josiah Stamp went to Paris as a member of the Young Committee to assess whether the reparations debts run up by Germany could be repaid. The similarities with the present position in Europe are too poignant to dwell on. In a letter to Keynes, Stamp compared these international meetings to a conjurer trying to pull a rabbit out of the hat. He described the meetings in these words. It's still a madhouse, in a way, but all are mad in a very genteel way, the main occupation being elaborate proofs from different angles of, of sanity. One half sit round a hat saying, there is a rabbit, there is. The other half try to make a noise like a succulent lettuce. There is a general conviction that the more eminent the conjurers convened, the more certainty is there of the existence of the rabbit. The only escape from madness is the power of ideas. Today we understand less than we would wish about how the economy works. The challenge of trying to understand more and developing those new ideas belongs to you, the next generation of students and academics at the LSE and elsewhere. Go to it. Sir, please, each of you, as you um, ask your question, tell us who you are, let us know your name and affiliation, and wait for the steward in the red shirt to give you the microphone. Black jacket. Yeah, that's it. Should be on. Hello? Oh. Hi. Mohammed Komawa, Westminster Kingsway College student governor. So Mervin, um if you was the Chancellor of Exchequer right now, right, 
What would you do to like, prevent the likeliness of another economic crisis occurring sooner and make the financial sector more robust? Well, one of the great uh, benefits of independence of the central bank is that the chancellor isn't the governor and the governor isn't the chancellor. So I'm not going to put myself in his shoes. But I do think that the framework that's been put in place is going through Parliament now is, I hope, and I think is a big improvement on where we were before. So I think that what we learned from the financial crisis was that when big banks like Royal Bank of Scotland got into really serious trouble and needed to turn to the Bank of England for, for cash to get to the end of the day, it became pretty obvious that the central bank could not separate itself from the process of supervising at least the capital and liquidity aspects of the behavior of the bank, the prudential supervision of the bank. And if you have to become the de facto prudential supervisor of a big bank, as we did in 2008, what we learned was that it's not a good idea not to have been the prudential supervisor for the 10 years running up to that. Uh, and uh, I think, therefore, it's been concluded, and this is true not just in Britain but in other countries around the world, that there is much to be said for having prudential supervision carried out by a body that's either very close to or inside the central bank. The other lesson we learned is the one I think that I tried to put across in my lecture, which is that monetary policy can do a number of things, but it can't hit all the targets at the same time. And what was so striking, you can see it, I think it's in chart nine, that the, the rise in the leverage of our big banks in the five or six years before the crisis hit was truly remarkable. And the only way I think to have prevented that, which led the banks into a very fragile position, would have been for a direct macro prudential instrument which would have limited the rate at which that leverage of banks could have increased. So I think we've now got three bodies, there are three policy committees in the Bank of England, effectively they're working already, the Monetary Policy Committee, the Financial Policy Committee, that's been going for over a year, and we're building, and we have been building for a year now, the new Prudential Regulation Authority, which will carry out prudential supervision in the bank, and is already being operated by Andrew Bailey, one of our uh, executive directors. So I think that is the, that's the message, the framework to put in place is monetary policy, financial stability, and microprudential regulation. That doesn't guarantee things, clearly, but I think it will give us, and I've seen it myself on the on the meetings of the Financial Policy Committee, that, that the depth, the, the detail, the attention to what's going on in the financial sector is something that I don't think you could ever really expect from the Monetary Policy Committee. But obviously all three will have to work together and that's why they've been put in the framework of being housed in the Bank of England. Good, thanks. The man in the violet shirt on the, my right there. My name's Jacob Carter, I'm a student at LSE and I also work at an investment firm in New York. My question is, you're improving and increasing the tools and arguing for more flexibility to prevent future crises, but as you said, uh, many of the risks and changes occur outside of the UK. Uh, my question is, how do you deal with leverage and risks of a global financial system where financial booms and crises travel at the speed of light via Bloomberg terminals and Google? Well, it's extremely difficult. I think. One of the problems that the nation state has is partly that these shocks can come very quickly from overseas, but what it still can do is to ensure the resilience of its own banking system. So one of the reasons why I'm strongly in favor of the reforms which John Vickers has proposed to separate the retail and commercial banking activity to put a ring fence around those activities and separate it from the trading and investment banking activities of banks is that I do think that whereas you cannot, as you point out, protect certain types of financial activity from being hit by shocks overseas, what you can do is to try and put a ring fence around the, the balance sheets of those institutions that are responsible for the majority of lending to the domestic economy in the form of lending to households, small businesses, and ensuring that the payment system operates smoothly. And I think that is absolutely fundamental because to my mind, I tried to, one sentence in the speech tried to sort of catch this when I, I said what you can do is to try and make resilient the bits of the financial sector that are fundamental to the working of the real economy and then you may have to allow a free market in other parts of the financial sector. 
Uh, I think to some extent the, the, these movements and across from one country to another have always been with us. I remember it is now more than 20 years since we did work in the LSE and the Financial Markets Group on the stock market crash of 1987. And one of the things that we were looking at there, it's almost 25 years ago, isn't it? Um, one of the things we looked at there was whether or not you could find evidence that disturbances to the stock markets in, say, New York or Tokyo <coughs> spilled over to the markets in London in a way that I think was rational in the sense that people in London were looking at those markets and saying, what have they seen that I haven't seen? And then incorporating some of that information. But it does mean that you're vulnerable then to shocks that may be just mistakes in one part of the world then being propagated around. And I think this is something where, you know, I'd certainly encourage a lot more research on it and there's much that we don't yet understand. Alas. Blonde <laughs> woman against the back wall and then the man next to her. Um, thank you, Laura Koonsberg, ITV News. Um, Mr. Governor, um, hello. Um, <laughs> you, you are rarely boring, even though it may be your, your, your wish, as you've suggested. But saying the Bank of England should sometimes be allowed to aim off the inflation target, that would be a very big change to their role. Is that what you're actually calling for, and have you discussed that with the government? No, it's not what I'm calling for, Laura. It is a different point, which is that if you look back over the last three or four years, where we have accepted an overshoot of the inflation target for a longer period than we would have wished, but for three or four years, in order to prevent uh, what would otherwise have had to be a much deeper recession in order to keep inflation closer to the, to the target. Now, that was caused by a sequence of shocks to oil and energy prices from overseas, together with the lagged impact of the depreciation of sterling. What I'm pointing out in the lecture is that there may be other reasons in the future for accepting an overshoot or indeed an undershoot, more likely, of inflation below the target, for, not forever, but just for a period of a few years, in order to make it less likely that the risk of financial instability would build up. Now, how we would calibrate that, I don't know. But I certainly don't think, I said it in the lecture, it was, in my view, perfectly consistent with both the spirit and the letter of inflation targeting as we have it. So I do not in any way suggest that the remit be changed. The remit already gives us the opportunity to avoid undesirable volatility in output by meaning that we don't bring inflation back to the target or we keep inflation a little above or below target for a longer period than we would normally do in responding to demand shocks where we think there is a good argument for it. But the test would be that the MPC would have to convince you and others that it was sensible to do that at this point. And, of course, what tends to happen is that whenever we do something like that, no one believes it's sensible. And afterwards, ten years later, they say, well, it's bloody obvious you shouldn't have done that, wasn't it? And um, that's the challenge we face. But we must go on arguing what we think is the right thing to do. And I do think that in the last few years, we were right to allow inflation to be above target because otherwise we'd have had to have an even deeper recession. And I think there could be circumstances in the future, though I don't know what they are, but there could be circumstances where concerns about future financial instability would mean that you deliberately took the risk, perhaps, to inflation on the downside rather than have it evenly balanced. Okay. Gentleman next, sir. Hi, thank you very much, Governor. Uh, Michael Climes, Digi Press. Um, Raghuja Rajan, um, in his really good book, uh, I thought it was a really good book anyway, Fault Lines, um, talks about the uh, recession uh, for I Bush Senior um, and then the dot-com recession, uh, uh, um, that both of those recessions were so-called so -called jobless recoveries because um, you had the recessions and then it took more than eight months to recover the jobs after those recessions struck. And um, he said that it really perplexed economists that they couldn't understand that why these two recessions in particular um, even especially the dot-com one, even though it was fairly small, why it took, I think it was, 43 months or something to recover the amount of jobs that had a disproportionate effect. So um, could you perhaps talk a little bit about your thoughts about why those recessions were, why you, had this, you didn't have a sort of recovery in jobs, even though, though you got an increase in um, output and productivity? Um, and also, could you maybe lead into... Sorry, <laughs> why has the current job recovery been so, so slow? I mean, 
Thank you. <laughs> well, <clears throat> to be honest, if I knew the answers to both those questions, then I suspect I'd have been able to... I think you should work on all this here at the LSE because you'll probably win a Nobel Prize for it. The, the behaviour of productivity and therefore impliedly the relationship between output and jobs has been one that we've had enormous difficulty in understanding, particularly in the last few years. So in recent years, as you say, we've seen the US economy recover without creating a large number of jobs, although in the last year they've gone back to more normal relationships between output and employment. Whereas in this country, what is quite extraordinary is that if you had known, if you had known in advance what the behavior of GDP was going to be in the UK, you would have predicted a much higher level of unemployment and a lower level of, un of employment than in fact we've seen. These are not easy to explain. But I think you touch on an interesting point um, about the early 2000s because, yes, it's certainly true that Regu Rajan's book is a very good one. What is striking, I think, in that period is that at the time in the early 2000s, people in the US were genuinely concerned that the, what now looks a relatively small recession and bursting of the bubble of the dot-com bubble, they thought this was, could persist for a very long time and it would be extremely difficult to get out of it. And the Federal Reserve struggled very hard to adopt a policy of keeping interest rates low for a long time to generate a recovery. And yet, only three or four years after that, people are now saying, well, it was obvious interest rates should have been a lot higher to stop what subsequently happened. I, I think the, the build-up of the size of the financial sector between 2002-03 and 2007, not just in the US, not just in the UK, but on the continent as well, was quite extraordinary and led to a degree of interconnectedness among big financial institutions, which made them very fragile, and they moved to levels of leverage, which meant that as soon as even a relatively moderate shock came along, it would have been rational for anyone who previously lent to that bank to say, oh, they could easily be bust by now. If you've got a leverage ratio of you know, 50 to 1, you've only got to see a fall in the value of the assets of 2% to be bankrupt. And when the shock came in 2007, no one really knew which banks were on the long side or which were on the short side of the subprime mortgage market and the very large derivative markets based on that. So I, what, what I would suggest is, and I, I do feel this strongly, you may think I would say it, wouldn't, wouldn't I, but I do actually believe it, that there are some really interesting puzzles and things we don't understand about the whole period between the mid-80s when we had financial liberalization and where we are today. And of course there are a group of people who will feel, well, their main job in life is just to say the answer's obvious and one group were wrong and they were right. And that is often where the political debate ends up. But actually, in terms of fundamental economics, I think there's some really important issues that we need to look at, which do pose challenges to the way our conventional theoretical models have been constructed. And the light striped shirt in the back there. Yeah, glasses. I want to raise your hand so someone can see you there. Yeah. Ah, uh, so Mervyn, assuming your tenure as Tell governor was... Uh, sorry, uh, my name is Owen. I'm a master's student in economic history. Uh, assuming your tenure as governor was uh, eternal, at what, at what point would you start worrying about peak economic output in Britain, in America, and around the world? Can you just re can you say, if, if my tenure was indefinite? In eternal. Eternal. <laughs> <laughs> what, would I, what would I be, be, be thinking about? Uh, at what point would you start worrying about peak, e peak economic output? Oh, I see. You mean how long is the current slow period of growth going to continue, in other words? That's a complicated way of expressing it. I'm the, uh, delighted to, to assure you that my term of office will come to an end at the end of June next year, and it will require an act of parliament or a revolution for that to change. So... Um, we honestly don't know, and I think that those people who believe they have a crystal ball to forecast the future are people who are seriously deluded. Well, we do not know. I think a decent central view with big risks on either side would be a slow, gradual recovery. That's what most of the outside forecasters seem to be projecting. But then what we do know is that so many unexpected events can come along. 
to dislodge that and change that. We have no idea what will happen in the United States to fiscal policy there. We have, certainly have no idea what will happen within the euro area. We don't know what's happening in China or the emerging markets. And I think one of the big challenges at present is to think through what is happening to the world economy as a whole. Before the crisis in 2007, at every IMF meeting for about 10 years, twice a year, we all had a big session on the imbalances in the world economy. And we, we thought long and hard about these. No one quite knew how it would come to an end, but we knew they couldn't go on indefinitely. The interesting thing is that we've been deflected from that over the past five years by the financial crisis. It's still the case that there are significant imbalances, particularly within the euro area, but also within other parts of the world economy. And when I go to Tokyo tomorrow, I hope to resume those conversations about imbalances. And once I understand more about that, then maybe I can give you a slightly more informative answer. <laughs> okay. Manning Gray, just near the door. Sorry, Mr. Director. Please look upstairs. <laughs> That's good advice. Thank you. <coughs> Uh, Keith Raffin, former Member of Parliament, how do you, how do you respond, Sir Mervyn, to uh, the concerns of Andrew Tari and the Treasury Select Committee? Their belief that the bank, with its greatly increased powers, must become more accountable, not just to the committee and to Parliament, but to a greatly strengthened and reformed court of the bank, which Mr Tari describes as being in the 18th century rather than the 21st. Well, I fear he doesn't understand how the court actually works. So let me tell you what kind of accountability we have and why I think it's actually a rather impressive degree of accountability. On policy, that is the policy of the MPC and the FPC and on regulation, those responsibilities have been given to us by Parliament and the individuals appointed to the various committees and boards are appointed by the Chancellor, <clears throat> not by the Court of the Bank, but by the Chancellor. They are directly accountable to the public through Laura and others going about reporting on what their activities, and we're also accountable directly to Parliament. Since the crisis began, I have been to Parliament over 30 times to various committees, more than any, any government minister to a parliamentary committee to give evidence. So I think we're pretty accountable in that sense. And after all, you can't open a newspaper every day without seeing somebody giving their views on whether or not the MPC or the FPC has done a good or a bad job. So in that sense, on policy terms, I think we are highly accountable. The court of the bank is not there and should not be there, in my view, to second-guess the decisions of the various policy committees. After all, if the court of the bank were to write a report saying um, we think the MPC set the wrong level of interest rate, I think the members of the MPC, including the external members, would say, well, I don't know who you are, but we were appointed to do this job. And if the Chancellor thought you were better at it, he'd have put you on the MPC, not us. Uh, we're accountable in a public debate. The role of the court is to ensure that the three committees are indeed held publicly accountable. The role of court is to commission reports from outside experts on the work of these committees, to present these in public, to say to the committees, look, here is a group of people that we asked to write a report on your performance and they actually think you didn't do a very good job. So will you please reply explaining why you think this outside report is right, wrong and if not, what have you learnt and what would you do differently in future? And the role of the court is not itself to take a view on that but to make sure that that debate does take place and is held in public so that the committees are held publicly accountable and have to explain and defend the policies they pursue. The role of court is also to ensure that the bank is managed and run properly. And I can assure you that the, uh, the, the quarterly reports that the executive of the bank make to the court in order to allow the court to carry out its function of managing the bank, including the work of the audit committee, and the non-executive directors on court who work and have been chairman of FTSE 100 companies say this is absolutely as good as anything you'll find in a FTSE 100 company. And I won't bother to make the comparison with government departments. Uh, so actually, I think the bank is pretty well run, and I think that in policy terms, we are very accountable. That doesn't mean to say that people will agree with what we do. And they may be right. 
maybe we will make mistakes from time to time. That should be something which is teased out in the form of a public debate and public discussion so that each of you can make up your own mind. Okay, continuing in the order which I've spotted people, white shirt far back upstairs. Thank you very much. Sir Mervyn, thank you very much for, for your speech. Uh, I'm a student here to, doing master's degree on risk management and uh, I'm on the, my dissertation phase and investigating uh, uh, rating agencies and their role in this current crisis and I was wondering if you could ask, answer the question like, um, like uh, the literature review revealed out that some authors blame rating agencies on, as a catalyzing factor for this current crisis. One of the factors of course. Um, to what extent do you think um, like um, their misleading of investors' vision and investors' belief uh, is uh, important. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. They, 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 uh, okay, sorry. They mislead investors' vis vision, credit awareness of, of companies. Having this in mind, uh, I was wondering why Bank of England and other government entities still rely and require on their right ratings. And uh, to, let's say. Um, is there any, are you taking any measures like to create alternative rating agents or something like that, let's say? Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, it's, it, it's a very interesting issue and we at the bank do not rely on rating agencies. We, we use the ratings, but we do not rely exclusively on them. And every judgment we make is our judgment about the collateral that we take and the attitude we take to the pricing of securities that we may uh, wish to, to borrow or take as collateral in a repo operation. So we don't rely on rating as agencies. I think it's become rather too easy for investors who made big mistakes to turn around and sort of blame rating agencies. It's a bit like people who buy shares by reading a tip in the newspaper and then blame the tipster when the shares go down instead of going up. Um, the big lesson is that it's very easy to get carried away at times with the belief that certain things are worth buying, that, that you need to get in there and buy it now before someone else buys it, and so you spend less time than you should assessing the riskiness of the assets that you buy. People were warned. I remember giving a speech before the crisis at the Mansion House, and I actually used the example of ratings agencies, and I actually said to people, it may say AAA on the bottle, but when you open it, you may find the champagne has gone rather flat. Now, the, the Bank of England in its various financial stability reports gave many warnings of that kind, but no one took much notice. And the problem we've got, and this is the great difficulty, is that when there is a period of optimism, people don't really want to learn and listen to advice or views of that kind. They, 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 got, they are slightly carried away. And the big question is, what can you do about it? Now, what we relied on at the time were what I called sermons. We preached sermons explaining to people that this was risky. People didn't take much notice. Should therefore you raise interest rates in order to give people a shock? Well, the problem with that is that you create real problems in the real economy with a downturn of output and a recession and higher unemployment. Maybe macroprudential policies would be a better way of doing it. We didn't have access to those before the crisis. And certainly the Financial Policy Committee will want to look and it will, I'm sure, monitor very carefully all the kinds of things that it, we were looking at before 2007, but about which then we could only preach sermons. And that from now in the future, the Financial Policy Committee will be able to take measures either directing the regulators to uh, stop taking or, or to warn banks and others not to take so much notice of ratings agencies. Um, and to increase the capital requirements on banks and others in order to try and calm things down a little, to take away the punch bowl before the party gets going. We'll see how it works. I think it's, it's, it, it's something that hasn't been tried in the industrialized world before on any significant scale. I believe it certainly is worth doing, but there is clearly an element of uncertainty about it. But given the scale of the crisis, it must be worth trying, given the problems that we, we faced. The one last point I make on rating agencies is that there was a debate really in 2008-9 about people looking around for scapegoats, and obviously one of the scapegoats were rating agencies. And there are two d difficulties with that approach. One is that then, of course, you produce a very strong incentive 
for rating agencies then to be incredibly cautious after the crisis has hit. In, they won't want to make the same mistake again. And then you may find them acting pro-cyclically in being more cautious than they should be when you need activity to pick up. And the other thing is that there was a suggestion that ratings agencies be run by the government. That would be a... Well, certainly if it's run by the public sector, it will be a disaster. Because the, the one thing you can be absolutely certain of is that the government debt of the country concerned would always get a triple A rating. <laughs> and if we've learnt one thing about government debt in the last five years is that they don't all deserve triple A rating. So a lot of interesting research to be done, and I wish you well with it. Okay, I've got a dozen people on my list and 15 more hands and very few minutes. Do you want to take a couple more questions? Of course, yes. Okay. The man in the, the blue sh shirt, the shirt there, at the hand up right this In the center, about four rows from the back. Thank you. My name is Andrea Pavadia. I'm a economic history student at LSC. Um, a while ago, I read an article called uh, Inflation Targeting is Dead by a prominent economist whose name I don't remember right now. And <laughs> well, I certainly don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> and he was uh, talking about all the unorthodox measures that the various central banks around the world have, token, have took uh, during the crisis and claimed that this meant that inflation targeting was now dead. Uh, I think you touched upon this in your presentation, that all this was possible because, exactly because we've had 20 years of inflation targeting and um, such a strict adherence to, to this policy that these unorth unorthodox measures were, could be taken. And on top of this, there was the energy shocks, the commodity shocks, and still inflation was under control. My question is, um, how long can this anchor last? Is there a limit? Uh, are we reaching that limit? Or can we keep going with these unorthodox measures for long? Well, I think there are a number of aspects to, to that question. I mean, let me take the first one, which is... Uh, let me let's step back a bit and comment on inflation targeting. You're right that it, it is the credibility that's been built up that's enabled us to tolerate for a short period inflation above target. Inflation is coming back to target, now back to 2.5%. Um, and I think the question of how long the inflation target will be credible in the sense of anchoring inflation expectations will depend on what policy does in the future. But they are still well anchored, so so far so good. A deeper question, I think, at present is how much more can monetary policy do to stimulate the economy? And I think there are some important questions about that because if you think that monetary policy, you know, there are two parts to it really. One is it, it helps to increase demand today and help increase output today. And that doesn't, therefore, to the extent that the increase in output matches the increase in demand, there's no upward pressure on inflation. But what it's also doing at the same time is giving people incentives to bring forward spending from the future to the present by having incredibly low effective interest rates. So spending today rather than the future is attractive. That's great for today. Unfortunately, as time goes by, you get to tomorrow. And once you've got to tomorrow, you realize you've dug a bit of a hole, transferred spending back to what is now yesterday, and what are you going to do? Well, you've got to bring it from the next tomorrow to today. And there's a limit to how far you can go on doing that. And, and I think that, therefore, we cannot be entirely sanguine about the ability uh, to keep bringing expenditure forward from the present, uh, from the future into the present. Now, what that means in practice, I don't know. There's no limit on the amount of asset purchases we could take. The scale of the deficit at present is such that the government is still issuing more debt than we are buying by some considerable margin. So uh, there's no technical limit on the asset purchases we can do. And I don't think it's an issue about the asset purchase policy. I think it's a deeper question about whether there are limits to what monetary policy as such can do. And I go back to what I said in the lecture, is that if you've been through a period when there were misperceptions and mistakes about the sustainable level of spending, when you correct those misperceptions and people realize that the level of spending they can sustain in the future, because they don't want to spend it all today, they want to spread it out, once they realize that that level is lower than they previously believed, 
you have to have an adjustment of the real level of spending one way or another. And, and that's the challenge that we face. I don't think it's easy. I don't think setting policy is remotely easy in these circumstances. And it's made infinitely more difficult, very much more difficult, than because other countries are facing the same problem. You can look to what happened in the, the Nordic countries in the early 1990s, and in many ways they had a very successful policy strategy of easy monetary policy, reorganizing the banking system, writing down the assets, recapitalizing the banks, putting them back in the private sector. It worked very well in the context in which the rest of the world was growing quite quickly. And the problem that we have, and it's true for all the countries facing difficulty, is ourselves, the Euro area, the United States, now China, India, and Brazil, are all facing economic difficulties. And therefore, the strategy of reducing domestic spending and relying more on external demand is facing a real problem because not everyone can do it at the same time. The man in the orange glasses there, yes, you're right here. Hand up. Just nudge me when you want to stop. Yeah, okay. Bye. Um, when, I, when I'm looking at forecasting an economy, I often realize that virtually every variable is re related in some way to every other variable you forecast. Yes. Now, when you're looking at macro prudential framework, some people like Larry Summers have said inequality within an economy is one of the uh, chief driver uh, cause of asset price bubbles. So when you're looking at your F FPC framework, that clearly inequality doesn't fall within that remit. So where do you set the limits and how do you kind of make it a realistic target that you set for the FPC, not an unrealistic target? I, I don't have a, a simple answer to that question, I'm afraid. I, I said in my speech that uh, macroprudential policy deals with the symptoms rather than the underlying causes of misperceptions and mispricing. And to the extent that factors like inequality are an underlying driver, macroprudential policy can't deal with it. What it may be able to do is partly initially to deal with the symptoms, to buy some time. And if it can identify the underlying causes, then it may be able to talk to the government and say, look, what is happening in this area is creating difficulties for us on the macroprudential front, and they're showing up in the financial system. A lot of what happens, I mean, the important point that you make is that a lot of what you see in the financial sector are messages. The financial sector and markets give messages about more fundamental things happening elsewhere. And if you just try and suppress the messages, you won't deal with the underlying problems. So, all I can say is that macroprudential policy may first of all mean that we notice what's going on and may, but only may, help to identify it. Otherwise, you'll have to do it. The man with the red and white pen in the air right there. Um, hello, my name is Ali and I'm a very young student. Um, I just wanted to hear from the man himself. Um, how would you go about bringing down the inflation rate target to to the target set by the Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee to, of 2% uh, with the use of the interest rates. So with the use of? Interest rates, the rate of interest. Well, it's what we're, we're doing now. Uh, we, uh, uh, as a very old central banker, I can tell you that we, <laughs> we used interest rates a lot for 16 years. And then, for the last few years, we've been unable to lower interest rates anymore. We've reached the bottom and we've been using asset purchases. The reason we've been using asset purchases is to do something that's actually rather similar to changing interest rates, which is to inject money into the economy. And I, what I would say is this, that the role of a central bank is to ensure that the amount of money in the economy is at the right level to support a sustainable growth rate of the economy at the desired inflation rate neither too much money nor too little. For almost all the post-war period, my predecessors had to struggle with the challenge of stopping the amount of money from rising too quickly, which pulled up inflation. And the way they did that was to raise interest rates. We could do it when we were independent. They pushed politicians to do it before the bank was independent. The extraordinary thing about current circumstances is that there is now too little money in the economy. This is a phenomenon we haven't really seen since the Great Depression. 
and the amount of money in the economy, not just the amount of banknotes or the reserves of bank, commercial banks or the Bank of England, but the money in people's bank accounts, is beginning to rise a little now. The policy is beginning to work, but it has been very low, broadly flat for quite a while. If the amount of money falls significantly, then you get to a Great Depression. That's what happened in the US in the 30s. And believe it or not, it's what's happening in Greece today. That's the great tragedy. The amount of money in Greece has fallen by 25% over the last three years. That's why they have a Great Depression in Greece. We are trying to make sure that it grows not too quickly, but just the right rate. Now, normally we do it by adjusting interest rates, which affects the de decisions by businesses and households uh, to borrow or less, more or less, and the amount of credit which the banking system extends to those households or businesses is on the other side of the same balance sheet with double entry bookkeeping, the deposits, the bank deposits of those agents. Now, instead of influencing the amount of money by, influence, by changing interest rates, we're doing it directly by injecting money into the economy, by buying gilts, government bonds, from people in the economy and giving them money instead. And then when they get the money, they can then use it to buy anything they like, other assets, goods and services if they want. And that money then moves around the economy from one bank account to another, helping to stimulate activity. So although we can't use interest rates at present because we've reached rock bottom, I hope we'll get soon to a point where we can get back to more normal period. Now that will depend on what happens to the economy. But we can mimic the effect of interest rates by injecting more or less money directly into the economy, and that's what the asset purchase scheme is designed to achieve. Okay, the very young student in the third row with the grey hair. <laughs> and then after this, after just this one, after this one. Right. Uh, thank you, Craig. I'll remember that. Uh, I'm indeed uh, a very old student in contrast to the previous uh, speaker. Uh, I'm an LSE alumni who wrote my PhD in economics in the mid-70s on the basis of a wonderful book on the UK tax system written by John Kay and Mervyn King. Governor, I really enjoyed your speech and I agree that uh, the clarity and simplicity of a single inflation target and a single instrument monetary policy has been absolutely crucial to uh, anchor, uh, anchor, uh, anchor inflationary expectations. And I think the Bank of England has been unambiguously successful in carrying out its then mandate. But that said, I also agree with an expanded mandate for the Bank of England going forward for the additional target, explicit target of financial stability and the additional instrument of macro prudential regulation. So my question is, is more from the past and for learning, not for blame, is in the lead up to the GFC. And that is to say, was there a government body or bodies outside of Bank of England that did have responsibility for financial stability and the main elements of what we're now terming macro prudential regulation? And if so, why did they not do better, apart from the very pertinent fact that you pointed out that this was a global phenomenon? Or was there simply nobody uh, that was explicitly charged with that separate target and given that separate instrument? And if there was no such body, why not? Financial instability is not a new problem. No, but I think uh, there was no body with any policy instrument specifically charged with maintaining financial stability. The view was that the Financial Services Authority had the microprudential regulatory powers to deal with individual financial institutions. The Bank of England had an overall mandate for financial stability, but the only thing we could do was to issue reports. So we did issue reports, but it didn't have any effect. And I think it's pretty obvious why. In a period of rising optimism, everyone appears to be successful because the prices are rising. No one questions or challenges whether this is a success or asks whether the reason you're successful is because too many risks are being taken. Now, I think the reason for that was that in 1997, when prudential supervision was taken away from the Bank of England, I supported that move, and I changed my mind subsequently. But the reason I supported it in 1997 was because the real risk at that point, following the crises or the banking problems in the 10 years running up to that period, had been ones to do with consumer protection. And both Eddie George and I were very, very clear 
that we felt the last thing the Bank of England should get involved in was consumer protection. That is a function for a very different regulatory body. So what was created was a overall regulator dealing with everything, prudential supervision and conduct of business, consumer protection and so on. And I think the lesson that we've learned over the subsequent 10 years was that in fact it's probably a better idea to split regulation as a whole between prudential supervision and conduct of business, consumer protection and so on, enforcement. The style of regulation is totally different between the two. One has to be much more legalistic to do with conduct, enforcing people to make sure their actions are appropriate. The other is making difficult judgments about whether someone has got too much leverage, whether they've taken too many risks. The kind of people, the style of supervision is totally different between those two. I don't blame anybody for that. This is something that we learned through experience. But what it did mean was that the FSA, if you look at the history of the FSA, what you find is that in their 10 years running up to the crisis, every single time a politician or a journalist or anybody or a member of parliament asked them questions, it was almost always about consumer protection, equitable life, issues about consumer protection or enforcement or even insider trading, conduct of business. It was never about prudential supervision of banks. And it was inevitable, therefore, that the attention and focus that they put into prudential supervision, given that no one appeared to be remotely interested in it and given that there weren't any failures or problems in the banking system, it was inevitable they had to put the resources into the areas where people were putting pressure on them. And indeed, the only complaints that were ever made by politicians about the FSA were not that they were giving, you know, light-touch regulation. It's the opposite, that they were being far too intrusive and bureaucratic. Uh, the Prime Minister at the time gave a speech which enraged the, um, the head of the FSA, rightly, because it publicly accused his own creation of being too bureaucratic. Well, now everyone looks back and saying, well, obvious, they didn't do any proper supervision. Um, <laughs> It, uh, it all shows that hindsight is a fantastically important instrument in economic policy. <laughs> so we, we learned from that experience, I think, and therefore, um, although people wrote about financial stability, having put the prudential supervision in a body that was very much focused on consumer protection and individual um, providers of financial services, individual banks, what got lost, I suspect, was the absolutely crucial insight that you, you supervise banks not to stop them failing, but to ensure that the stability of the system as a whole is enhanced. That is, you've got to create a way in which badly run banks can be allowed to fail without damaging the system as a whole. And one of the great advantages of the new Financial Policy Committee is that it can, if you like, set the agenda for the system as a whole within which the individual micro-prudential supervisors have to work. And that's exactly how it's worked out in the last 12 months. I really think a big improvement is, can be seen in the way the Financial Policy Committee interacts with the group in the FSA that are currently doing prudential supervision. So I'm much more optimistic about the future. Okay, about the future, we are at the point of the last question. The gentleman in the black turban in the first row upstairs. Gadget Sandu, I'm a household. Uh, my question is, why would more powers to the Bank of England stop future crisis when clearly the Bank of England were unable to make the gamble or brave decisions when they needed to? And would or could any unelected official ever be able to make the required brave or gamble decision in the future? Well, I think the reason why monetary policy was delegated from politicians to the central bank was that the central banks find it easier to make those brave decisions because they're not facing re-election the next day and because they have one, uh, they're very concerned about their own reputations and they've been given a very clear remit by Parliament not to fall prey to the day-to-day -to -day political temptations that, that they themselves might fall prey to. And I think the record around the world of an independent central bank in maintaining price stability shows that that is actually a good idea. So I don't think in principle the same, I think in principle the same argument will apply to financial stability. It's more difficult to give a precise objective. 
But I think I see very much when I go to meetings of the Financial Policy Committee that this is a group of very, very well-informed and qualified people who know a lot about the financial system, debate among themselves about what actually needs to be done. And I think we, we have learned about what happened in the financial sector in the run-up to the crisis. I think that both the microprudential supervisors and the macroprudential financial policy committee would not allow a repeat of that crisis again. Now, the difficulty, of course, is that in future we don't know what kind of crisis could occur. And I can't guarantee or promise that the FPC or indeed the new Prudential Regulation Authority will spot it. What I can guarantee is that because of the way they're constituted, they will be run by people who are highly qualified, do know what they're doing, and have every incentive. You don't have to trust them as such, but they have every public incentive to get this right because they will be held accountable and will have to go to Parliament more times than you could yourself possibly wish to go. <laughs> On that note, Mervyn, this has been wonderful. Thank you for an elegant speech. Answers above and beyond the question.